presentation. Um, let's get started. Uh, my name is John Lamb. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys um, a bit about what me and about five of my friends have been working on for the past seven months. Um, we've been building this thing called Our Tools of Visual Studio. We have this thing out now in um, a public preview form that's, you know, you can go download, I'll show you where to get it, and all that stuff as well. Um, I want to first, this is mostly for my benefit so I can level set with the audience that's inside of this room. And the first thing is, through a show of hands, how many of you have never written a line of R code in your life? Almost everybody. Okay, this is perfect. Right, that's what I guessed. Right, so, um, so a big chunk of this talk, I've been talking to actual R users for the past week or so um, since we uh, shipped our public preview. So there I have a completely different talk for those guys. Um, so here, that, that's great. Um, again, um, some other things. How many people have actually written some R code or read some R code? So there's, there's a few, few of you folks here. Now, of, the, of those of you who are doing those things, how many of you are using a relational database as kind of part of your day-to-day your -day work? Maybe half of the people that raise their hands. Um, let's see. How many of you guys are responsible for writing code that some other R guy in your company created? Like, in other words, operationalizing this thing. So there's one guy, maybe two or three, that, almost nobody um, does that. Okay. Um, Let's see, yeah, a bunch of other things. Um, Excel, people interested in Excel, you know, as a canvas potentially for output as well, right? Because I think there's a lot of interesting things, right? Because the, the, the part of the talk where I'm gonna start with is I'm gonna talk a bit about how Microsoft is now an official R vendor, right? About a year ago, we completed the acquisition of a company called Revolution Analytics, which was effectively the enterprise R vendor. Um, there are a couple of products that Revolution has and you know, they, they had a product called, um, which we have now renamed, I'll just call it the current name, the old name doesn't matter. Um, Microsoft R Open is an open source implementation of R, which is essentially built exactly on the real R distribution, but with an interesting twist. The twist is it also packages in a set of libraries called the Intel Math Kernel Libraries. And the Intel Math Kernel Libraries will accelerate linear algebra operations, which are at the heart of a lot of the algorithms um, that people are interested in R. Um, so the cool thing about Microsoft R Open is that it's a free um, open source, you can download it. It's available not just for Windows, but for a variety of different Unices um, as well, in addition to um, uh, support on the Mac, right? So you, know, so you can go off and get that and get accelerated computational speed for some set of operations, right? Because of course, there's lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. Um, so, so there's that. Now there's another product that we have that's called Microsoft R Server. And this is the only slide I promise you that, that you're gonna see today. Um, and it goes by a variety of different names because you know, we've, we've been changing things back and forwards for a while. But um, what this, we call this thing Microsoft R, Open, or R Server, right, is the, is the name. You'll hear it sometimes called Scale R as well. So there's a bunch of functions that have been created inside of the Scale R library. And what they do is they allow you to work with data sets that don't fit in RAM, right? Because fundamentally, if you've ever used R before, R is all about in-memory computation, right? And a data structure that I'll show you today um, called the data frame. So it's almost entirely built around this data structure. Um, what this allows you to do is when things don't fit in memory, um, this is the set of um, um, functions that you can now use uh, to work on these large data sets that you might um, have to work with as well. Right, so that is the Microsoft R server product. And that's also available in a developer edition, so you can download this thing for free and play with it and experiment with it on the data set set um, that, that you're working with that don't currently fit in memory. All right, so enough of all of this. Away, okay. Now let's, uh, let's switch over to the thing you've been waiting to see, which is, of course, Visual Studio. Um, so our tools are Visual Studio. There's a bunch of interesting things I want to tell you about this um, thing first, and I'll just do it in a bunch of tabs inside of um, um, Edge. Uh, the first thing is it's an open source project. It lives up on GitHub. We ship this thing under the MIT license. So all the source code here for this Visual Studio extension um, is available there. You can, of course, um, go off and download um, uh, it as well. So you can find the documentation of it at this site. Just type it in your favorite search engine. It'll go find it. Um, 
But here is our documentation page where you'll find the docs for how to use the different features um, that we have inside of um, uh, RTVS as well. Now what's interesting about RTVS is RTVS comes in a couple of uh, parts, if you will, right? So there's this part, which is a Visual Studio extension, and then there's this other part, which is Microsoft R Host. Um, and in this kind of interesting spirit of openness, I wanted to show you guys the license file. Right, R itself is GPL. This is the part of R that bolts onto the R um, executable process. So it, of course, is also released and shipped under um, the GPL v2 license as well. I believe we're probably the first product team at Microsoft to ship um, code under GPL v2. Um, so moving along, this was our server, our open. Um, if you're interested in the R open um, product as well, you can come over here. There is a, um, there's a download page here. And what you'll see is the different flavors of Unix that you can go off and um, install this. And that MKL column there is um, for you to download. Again, two separate um, installations for the same. One is for um, the, the, the R distribution itself, which includes the interpreter and a bunch of base libraries, and the MKL library packages, which is where you get all the accelerated math routines as well. Cool. All right, so that's the preamble. Let's, let's take a look at the, uh, the product. So, Couple of things inside of Visual Studio, of course, we can go off and create a new project. Um, the project here is the R project. We can just say OK, just to give you a feel for what it looks like when it um, creates a new um, product uh, project out of the box. We create a blank script file here. If I type something simple like this, a 3 plus 3 in here, one of the things and one of the styles of programming of R in the in the language itself is that it's very oriented towards interactive programming. Right, so there's a lot of, I'm gonna type a line of code, it's gonna run, I'm gonna see some result of my computation, I'm gonna iterate on that. So that inner loop of typing something and running something um, is, is integral to the workflow of anybody using the language. Now, what's interesting is you're seeing an editor buffer inside of Visual Studio right here. And when I type three plus three into here and I hit control enter, what you'll see is um, down below, we've executed the, the line of code that I had there and the result is printed in the interactive window. So there's these two windows. I typically like to put these things side by side where I have an editor buffer and I have this interactive window. And what I tend to do, um, and other people work differently than me, is I, I like to type the code first into the editor buffer because I like the editing experience that I have in an editor buffer. Editing things in history and things kind of makes sense as opposed to a REPL where you have to hit up arrow um, in order to go back and edit things. Um, and then I hit control enter or I select a range of code in order to run it um, inside of uh, the interactive window. Um, let me bring up uh, this demo project, which I'm gonna be walking through for the rest of this talk. You can find all of the code here um, at this location, uh, my build demo there, I'll give you guys a link at the, um, the end of this. But what this thing does is it kind of walks you through a bunch of um, interesting examples of the R language. Because again, for this audience, since almost everybody raised their hand when, when asked, have you ever written a line of code? You know, never written a line of code before. Um, uh, so I, I thought I would show you some of the more interesting aspects of the language. Um, so there's all sorts of things that will look weird and strange to you pretty much straight out of the gate, right? So this very first line of code there where I'm gonna assign something to a variable looks really strange. All right, let me, uh, there you are. Okay, so let me finish docking this. Now, you might be wondering, what on earth is this arrow thing? And so let me give you a quick little history lesson, because I think this is interesting and important. Um, this was what the predecessor to the R language, which was called S, was developed on, that machine there. And what was interesting about this machine is when you press that key, right, where there's an underscore and there's an equal sign there, um, when you hit the underscore key, it actually prints a back left arrow. This thing was actually a thermal printer. Right, so, um, so what was interesting about that was, of course, everybody wound up doing this. Now, that was a long time ago, so if you do things like use the equal sign, that also works, right? And once upon a time, the underscore character was assignment um, inside of R. Thank God they got rid of that. Um, so that immediately kind of looks a little bit strange to you um, when you're looking at this language. Now, idiomatic R almost always uses that left arrow thing, right? So if you want to write code that other R people won't think you're strange for writing, um, you, you should write it in that first form as opposed to the second form, but both forms work as well. And of course, if you just want to add things, they, they work like this. Now, 
you're looking at something like the number three, right? If you're used to other languages, say C sharp, right, you would expect that this is a value type, right? And you know, this is a number, right? I, we, we understand what numbers are, right? Maybe it's an eight byte floating point number. Well, as it turns out, you can ask our a bunch of questions like, well, is this thing actually this thing called a vector? Now, vectors in R are these um, homogeneous collections, one dimensional homogeneous collections of things, right? They could be numbers, they could be strings or other things. Now, it says, yeah, is, ve is, is vector is true, so yeah, this thing's actually a vector, and of course, it's a vector of length one, right? So there aren't actual value types, and these are these kind of weird things that you know, may or may not trip you up inside of the language as you um, start working with it. Now, if I want to create a vector with more than one thing in it, I can use the combine function or the C function um, inside of um, R. And uh, so you can execute that. You can see I can ask it what its class is, right? So what's the class of the items inside of it? Turns out they're characters. And of course, this thing is also a vector. Now, a little word of warning for you. Lots and lots of single letter functions exist in the R language. And of course, you can redefine variables inside of R. Right, so one of the very first R programs I wrote, right, I was typing A equals this, B equals something, and C equals something, right? Imagine what happened there, right? So I redefined C, which is used everywhere in R, and nothing worked after that, right? So, um, so be careful, right? T is also another variable that you're gonna run into, which is transpose, um, that, that you're gonna run into inside of R as well, right? So just a couple little things. Um, you index, things are one-based, right, not zero-based. Right, so get used to that. Um, now, some other interesting things. This is just another example of a vector here where I just have numbers. So you can see it comes back and asks, tells me that it's a numeric. There's an is numeric as well. When you're looking at function names like is dot vector, the dot is part of the name. Okay, there's no dot operator inside of R. Right, so again, right, like I'm, I'm Telling you all this stuff for a reason, right? Like, these are just the weird things that you'll have to get used to inside of the language. Now, moving along, so here's some examples. Now, this is kind of cool. So, vectors and the values inside of vectors can have attributes attached to them. All right, so what I just did there was I took my V2 vector, which had the numbers one, two, and three, and I assign names to them, right? So, you know, I, I, I have this thing, names at V2 is I'm gonna assign that, that new vector to it. And so you'll see when I print it back out in the, in the corner there, it says, you know, um, when I just dump V2 out, it says one, two, and three as the labels um, for the values, right? So you can, you have this ability to go off and do this kind of labeling or attaching of attributes to these objects um, in R. Now, another handy dandy command is stir. Stir is what you can use to examine the structure of an object, right? So you can use that to dump out the internal representation of um, how things look like. Implicit type conversions are evil, as we all know, but of course, right, in, in a lot of these languages, they, they tend to do these things for you, right? So there's a widening conversion that happens here where I'm gonna um, assign this. So you, as you might imagine, right, it turns everything into a string, right? Because that's the, the thing that's gonna hold all three of those types, right? And again, when you ask it, it's, it's now this vector of uh, class character. Another type, this is probably the last type we're gonna talk about here, um, is the list. Lists are different than vectors in that lists can be heterogeneous. So here is a case where I can have a list which has numbers and characters. If I dump them, what you'll find is, this looks a little bit weird when I dump, dump it, but it kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? The square bracket operators are used to index into a vector, and of course, those values that you would think of inside of the list are actually vectors, right? So you have to do this double indexing in to get the, the value back out, right? So these are the, the reasons why you need to learn this stuff here. Right? Otherwise, lots of things just won't behave quite the way you would expect them to um, inside of the language. Now, uh, here's just some more examples of this. Now, let me take you now to the, perhaps the central data structure. Like when I talked about earlier, R as a language is built entirely around the data frame. Right? The data frame is this two-dimensional data structure, um, which allows you to have heterogeneous collections of values um, inside of the data frame. Right? So think, you know, I just went out and did a SQL query and I have a row set, I can plop that thing straight into a row set and we'll see some examples of that. Or I can go read a comma separated variable file and dump that into my row set or my data frame and we'll see examples of that too. 
One of the most clever things in the R language and its libraries that I haven't seen anywhere else is this idea that it comes with data. Right? How many times have you had to like demo something, right? Some function or some functionality. So oh, I need some data, right? And you make something, you get some file. Inside of the packages, right, that you install, you'll also find that a lot of them just come with data. And we'll see some examples of how you can get help with the, for the sample data sets that R comes with. Empty cars happens to be a data set that's used quite a bit. Let me show you that. Empty cars is a data frame. So as we see this thing scrolling down here, this, this guy here is a data frame. And um, we can look at its structure, and it dumps out some of the values, and, and we can dump its class as well. So what MT cars is, is it's this data frame that's built into um, one of the base libraries inside of R that contains a bunch of statistics about cars from Motor Trend 1972. Right, so a bunch of cars, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, um, fuel economy numbers and things like that. So it's used a lot in, the, in the, the sample code for R as they're explaining how to plot things and other things. And we'll see a lot more of data sets um, as well. So what I've been showing you is this interaction between these two panes. And I find that I, I, I tend to do an awful lot of that. Over on the right-hand side is the REPL, right, or the R interactive window. I've been executing all sorts of commands throughout this thing. So as you might imagine, as I hit the Cursor, let me just scroll this up a little bit more. So as I hit the cursor down and cursor up keys, you can go navigate back and forth um, through the history. I have our history window over here. All right, so if I wanted to rerun a command like is vector over here, I can just double click on that. That will copy it over here and I hit enter there to re-execute the command, right? So a lot of the things you'd be used to in any kind of command shell um, using history, right, are available inside of our REPL as well. Um, okay. So, moving on. So let's, let's take a look at this guy here. Because, of course, to be an IDE, you kind of need this, this part of it, right? The, 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 the debugging aspect of it. So we have a debugger for R that uses the Visual Studio debugger. Um, so let me show you, there's a couple of functions here. Um, it's just gonna go off and call F2, it's gonna call F1 passing X plus one, and we're just gonna step through some of the code here. Now, of course, in Visual Studio, Visual Studio and R are kind of different. R, you, there, there's another very popular um, IDE that's used by almost everybody in the R community called R Studio. And inside of R Studio, there's no modes, right? Because they invented their own IDE. But of course, Visual Studio has a notion of modes, right? There's the mode where you're typing code, and then there's the mode where you're debugging code. So to respect that, we have this attached debugger um, um, button that you first have to click. So that attaches the debugger to the R process. Now the way to understand how things work is that there's the Visual Studio process where all of our um, IDE lives, and then there's a separate R execution process, this R host process. Right, so you'll see that there's an exe called microsoft.rhost.exe um, that's on your machine. You'll see it in Task Manager when it's running um, as well. And we use an inter-process communications mechanism um, through name pipes right, to go communicate back and forth um, between the two. Um, so now that I've attached my debugger, the next thing I can do is I need to tell the runtime what code to execute. All right, so typically you do this by right clicking on this and saying source the R script. All right, sourcing is um, essentially tells the R runtime, take the contents of this file and feed it to the interpreter and start running it. All right? So unlike, you know, you're used to F5 in Visual Studio, right? I hit F5, but if it's a C sharp you know, console application, for example, right? There's a main function, right? There's no equivalent main function. Um, so you really have this extra step where you have to tell it, this is the code I want you um, to run. So now we're sitting in here, so the very familiar Visual Studio debugger stuff here. We see our locals window over here. Um, and I can F11 into this guy. I can F11 into this guy as well, and I can bring up the call stack. Let me show you that. Right, so you can see the, 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 the call stack that we're currently sitting in. Um, right now, and you can also see the local variables. Now here's something interesting here. Like notice that the yellow arrow sits up here, we can hit F10 to step through here. It still says X plus one. R has lazy deferred evaluation of expressions, right? So the expression isn't evaluated at the caller site, it's evaluated when it needs to be evaluated. It's effectively like a promise um, inside of JavaScript. So you'll see that over here in this next line of code, we're gonna force it to evaluate at this point, right, because we're reassigning the value, and you'll see over here that um, inside of the locals window, the, 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 the value is now 44. All right, so F5 continues execution. Um, all of those things, the things that you would expect 
would work. Now, right now, I'll tell you in our preview release, because we've only been working on this thing for about six months now, um, we, it does that. Right? And it does a little bit more than that, and it might crash and a few other things. Right? We're very early in the process. Um, so there's a few things that you might want that are currently missing as well. So for example, the step out or the shift F11 um, function, right? we don't quite have that yet right? because that, that turns out to be very challenging to implement in R. Um, we don't have conditional breakpoints and a few other things. Right? But there's a lot of things that are certainly in the backlog. You can see our backlog of items on GitHub as well um, for the features that we're going to um, be implementing as we move to get to our V1. So let's stop here and let's go on to the next step. So we looked at the debugger part. Now the next thing that you would expect in an IDE is some notion of help, right? And as it turns out, R has a very a fantastic help system. So for example, if I wanted to have help, I can use the question mark operator to go, um, in this case, I wanted to get help on the read.csv function. If I hit control enter on that, it goes up and executes it and it displays it inside of an external web browser window. If you're a person that likes to do this, we have an option inside of Visual Studio. So this is our, our tools um, menu that we add to Visual Studio. And underneath here in options, we have this thing that says, hey, where do you want the help browser to run? We can run it either in this automatic mode or an external. I just personally find that external is way more useful than the automatic, which puts it in a tool window, and help in a tiny tool window is just way too small to be um, really useful. So, um, now another thing to realize is that help, this help operator only works for loaded packages, right? So, in this case, if I didn't have dplyr, I actually happen to have dplyr loaded. Um, if that didn't work, you wouldn't find it, right? So you first have to load the library first um, before you, you can go and get the help for the function. Now, if what I wanted to do was search instead of look things up by index, for example, use the double question mark operator, and that will just search across all of the help, and you'll see all the places where, um, where filter appears inside of the documentation. Now, there are packages in R. You can think about packages in library analogously, right? They, the R community tends to be very you know, pedantic about what they call these things, right? So they like to call these things packages as opposed to libraries. I call them libraries still. Because I use a, a function called library to go load something. Um, the inside of a package, you'll find that not only will some packages contain sample data, but they'll also have these things called vignettes. And what a vignette is, is it's essentially a document. So for example, here's the vignette for the dplyr um, uh, package, which will explain a bunch of things about how to use it. Right, so there's lots of this very rich documentation that comes along with it. Sometimes it's in PDF, sometimes it's in HTML, depends on um, what the package author um, wanted to do. So there's the vignettes for a particular package, in that case, deplier, or I can look at all the vignettes that happen to be installed for the packages I have locally installed on my machine. Right, so all these things um, exist there as well. So there's tons and tons of documentation um, available um, for R. Now this is this data um, example. So this is an ugly thing which we've already fixed in our, in our main branch. Um, this thing's currently popping up inside of this ugly window, but we have it in a, in a browser window now, yay. Um, but this will give me the, the names of data sets that I can use inside of a particular package, or as we saw here below, I can browse all of the different sample data. So this is all of the sample data that's available um, for the packages I have installed locally on my machine. All right, so again, lots of really cool things. Now, moving along. So we looked a little bit about help. Now let's focus more on this data frame thing. And I wanted to, again, since it's this audience, um, I wanted to look, take a look at importing data from SQL Server, right? Because you know, a lot of people here use uh, relational databases. But again, this data frame um, data structure is just this rectangular data structure that can accept data from any, different, any number of different places. So the package that you typically will use is the RODBC package. Um, to connect to um, SQL Server. And in this case, I have a local data source name already configured on my machine, so I don't have a giant, long, ugly connection string, although if that's what you like to do, you can do that as well. Um, now, for example, if what I wanted to do was look at all of the tables inside of this baseball database, so the, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be looking at um, a, a free and open source database called the Lawman database of baseball statistics, right? So this is baseball stats going historically back to 1871 for every game that's ever been played. Um, so 
if uh, we go and read the contents of this table, you'll see that there's this tables thing that I just evaluated. If I um, type tables over here manually and hit enter, it's going to dump the contents of it to the console. Not very useful. Um, but we have this thing over here called the variable explorer. So in the variable explorer, you can see that there's a tables. And what this does is it allows me to drill into this data structure. Remember, this thing's a data frame. So you're seeing some of these funny double square bracket operator things and things that, that you now all understand why that's the case. Um, now this, and we can drill in arbitrarily deep into this as well. Or what I can do is I can click on this hourglass thing, which brings up my table viewer, um, which allows me to look at the data here more conveniently. So this is just a list of all of the tables that exist inside of that particular SQL Server um, system database. Um, now let's look at the actual data. So let's run a query. So here, I, let's select that code, control enter, and um, we'll run it. And you can see batters came back, and it's got 101,000 rows um, that I just read into um, the batters um, data frame. And let's bring this up here so you can see the full extent of the data here. Now we spent a lot of time optimizing the performance of this guy as well, so you'll find that even though it's 100,000 rows inside this thing, we do the right thing with Windows and moving just the data that we need to move back and forth between the two processes in order to render it for um, display um, as well. A lot of features are coming in this thing, right? So again, this is pretty rudimentary. We focused a lot on the rendering performance of this thing first, but a lot of things that you would expect to be able to do, like click on the headings to sort and those kinds of things and do filtering and searching operations, those are all um, coming and sitting on our backlog right now. In fact, some of them were already implemented. So there's that. Now. A particularly interesting thing, now this is really no different than if this was you know, SQL Management Studio or some other tool that you're used to looking at data in. Um, and in fact, without the sorting thing, it's worse than SQL Management Studio. Now here's some interesting things that you can start doing once, you're, once you've got the data. You can now start passing data frames to functions in our libraries, and this is the reason people love R. It's not because of the quirkiness of the language and all this other stuff, right? People love it because it has the libraries that you need to do um, statistical analysis or machine learning. Um, operations on the data that you already have. So the most of what you're going to do, spend your time on, is kind of getting the data in the shape um, that you want, cleaning the data, um, and fitting it into the right structures or eliminating the data that you don't care about. And then you're going to be calling functions um, that do interesting operations. Here's perhaps the most basic one here, which is, hey, just give me the summary statistics of every single column inside of that data frame. That's what summary does. All right, so you can already see some data there. If you know your baseball stats, you'll know that Barry Bonds has a single season home run record, and this is data per year, right? So you can see here under um, home runs, wherever that is. Uh, uh, where did it go? It's, it's here somewhere. Oh, it scrolled off. This side. There it is. Right? Um, you can see that, you know, as expected, you can see there. But what's kind of cool is the mean home runs is 2.9, right? That's, I always find that amusing. So um, let's uh, look a little bit further into this. So let's. Uh, Here's another SQL statement where I'm just going to narrow it down to that guy, right? So you can see the data shows up there. Um, I can also do joins in SQL. So again, right, a slightly bigger um, thing here, and and we can we can see the results of that data um, printed out to the console. Now, a particularly interesting thing because R and this this data frame data structure is all designed to be used in memory on your client machine. I can just read a bunch of tables into memory and I can now start interacting and, and working with it in R itself, right? So let me show you some examples of that. Um, let's first read this, this master table which contains just the names um, and some stats about um, the, the players themselves, the player, the person. And we're gonna use a library that's extremely popular called dplyr. Um, and what dplyr is, is it's a data manipulation language, uh, a library or package um, that allows you to do things like this. Right? So you can kind of squint and see SQL through that. Right? You can say, hey, I'm going to start with batters. Right? So batters is that first data frame, right? that hundred and some odd thousand row data frame that I initially read in. And then there's that weird looking thing that you see there, right? that percent, right? greater than sign percent thing. Right? That is the pipe operator inside of R. It was shamelessly stolen from F-sharp 
and the forward pipe operator inside of F-sharp and, uh, and put into here. So you can see that this is now, normally what you would do is you'd have intermediate, you could imagine what this would look like if you were to try and write this out as a series of function calls, right? Right, I'd have to pass in for the this pointer, the current data frame that I want to work on, assign things to intermediate variables, or I'll have a bunch of nested function calls or some other set of things, right? You can imagine what this looks like, and this is just much easier to read um, when you look at it, right? So you can see batters. I'm going to pipe it to an inner join. I'm going to inner join against the master data frame um, by the column there, player ID, and I'm going to pipe it into a filter operation, and the filter operation will just look for the guys that hit 73 home runs in a season. Right? And that's going to go off and run. And when we take a look at what that looks like, we can see that this gives me essentially the same data that I had above right, for Barry Bonds in both cases. Now let's take a closer look at the data itself so we can do some more interesting transformations. So if we were to look at the data for Kenny Lofton, for example, you'll see that Again, this is very typical of the kinds of things that people want to do when they are um, inspecting data and munging the data and doing this all interactively. You'll notice that, um, hold on, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the batter saying, look at the wrong frame. Let's look at Kenny Lofton. This is what I wanted to look at. You can see that you'll look at the data, so what, what's the shape of the data? And you'll see that the data is broken up so that if a player played on more than one team in a given season, right, that you'll have rows, right, for, for each, um, each team that the guy played for um, in that season. You'll see a couple of examples of that, you know, in, say, 2002, right, as a year. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to compute the, 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 the roll-up um, numbers here, right? So the couple of other observations I want to make is when you're reading things out of a um, database, um, you'll find that sometimes the column names are nonsensical in the language, right? So 2B and 3B were the, the column names um, for the table, right? But of course, you can't use a variable named 2B or 3B um, inside of the language. So we have to do some um, little modifications here. So here's a couple little functions that I have here that we're just going to use to fix up and convert the names from 2B to X2B. And this will just give you some examples of using functions. And we're going to call this function passing in the Kenny Lofton um, data frame. It fixes up the data. And now we can see that the names here, you'll notice that um, over here in the, the table viewer that we've dynamically updated it um, whenever the, the underlying data structure changes um, inside of R. Now here's where it gets a little bit more fun. Here's a slightly more complicated computation, but I'm just going to do a roll-up operation using the summarize function in R. And so what summarize does is it walks through all the things I'm grouping by player ID and year, um, and then I'm just going to compute the totals right for each one of the columns um, inside of there. So I can now generate a new data frame that contains just the data I want, which is just the data for each year. All right, so looking at this again, um, looking at the annual data, Let's look at it in this view. You'll see that what I, I've eliminated is the team name, right? But I've, I now have all these nice summarized total stats for each year, right? So again, very representative things that people want to do in terms of munging the data um, to get to the form where um, they're happy with it. Now, so far we've been looking at visualizing data entirely inside of Visual Studio itself, right? Or inside of a console window where we're just typing text out. As it turns out, there's this really cool hardware accelerated rendering engine that has billions of dollars of investment pushed into it for decades now. You know what it's called? HTML, right? So what you can also do is visualize things in HTML. So there's this set of libraries in the R world called HTML widgets. And this DT library is an example of an HTML widget. So what this does is it takes that data set, exports it out to um, HTML, and now like, we can look at this, we can sort. So this is how you can do this kind of sorting thing and filtering if I just wanted to look at you know, his stats from 1998, so this kind of dynamic thing. The things that you're used to in HTML, these are the kinds of things that you can get um, in here as well, right? So you can style it using CSS and all the technologies that, um, that you're, you're used to as developers. So this is pretty cool as well. Now, so 
Let's uh, move on to the next thing. So we, we spent a little bit of time looking at data. Now, one of the, the strengths of R is its visualization and the libraries that it has for plotting the data that you have, right? Seeing relationships graphically are the things that, you know, the, the, that visually humans are extremely good at processing and R has a tremendous wealth of plotting libraries. And this is perhaps the thing that sets apart the most is that you can do these programmatic plots of things. So let's take a look at this. This is that same roll-up function that I had before. Now this time I'm gonna reread some data that we did in the previous example. Um, so, but instead of reading it from SQL Server, I'm just gonna read it out of a file, right? So in this case, this is a comma separated variable file. Um, we're gonna use the dplyr library again. We're gonna do a little bit of filtering. Now here again is a great example of this piping operator in action, right? So I'm gonna take the batting stuff, I'm gonna filter it so the guys only have more than 50 at bats are in here, call the roll up thing, right? So the roll up thing does all that summary statistics stuff. I'm gonna pat, I'm only gonna select two columns out of it, hits and at bats, and I'm gonna pipe the, the result of that thing to the sample function. What the sample function will do is randomly sample 5,000 um, rows out of that data set, right, and return that to me, right? And I'm only doing that because it normally is like 47,000 or something comes out of this thing, but it's just a little bit quicker to plot interactively in an audience um, when I just limit it to 5,000. And then what I can do is I can go do a plot. So if I execute this thing, you'll see over here in the right-hand corner, I have this plot window and this tiny, tiny little plot shows up. So of course, if I make this thing bigger, what we'll do is we'll re-render it. So every time you resize that window, what we'll do is we'll re-render using all the available pixels um, that, that are on your screen so you can see um, the, the data that you have there. You can export it, you can copy it to the clipboard, you can do all the things that you'd imagine you'd wanna be able to do um, with data that looks like this. Now this is, this function here, you can see, one of the things that you'll notice in R is that there's kind of multiple generations of libraries that exist. And, they're converging into this more modern R style, right? So here is, you know, there's plot. I'm gonna say, hey, hitters, this dollar sign operator is what we use to um, slice into it to say, I want the at bats column, right? And then hitters, dollar sign H will give me the hits column um, out of that, that data frame. And then there's just a bunch of name parameters for the axes and the title and stuff like that. Now, what we're now gonna see is the kind of evolution of R very quickly, there's a library called ggplot. GG stands for the grammar of graphics. And so Hadley Wickham is a guy whose name that you'll hear over and over again in the R world um, because he's contributed by far the most number of libraries of anybody alive um, inside of the R world. Um, so dplyr, this data manipulation library, is, is a thing that Hadley created, as is this ggplot library as well. And what ggplot does is it tries to give you this grammar so that you can learn a small number of primitives and compose them together in interesting ways um, to generate more complicated plots. Instead of just having this one function where I need to memorize all of the different possible name parameters inside of this thing in order to construct a plot. All right, so again, very kind of tailored towards this interactive style of programming. So now what I've done is I've executed those four lines of code and I've assigned the result to the p variable. And so when I run this thing where I say, hey, show me the p variable, it will go and do a plot over here. So you can see that this plot shows up there. The thing that's a little bit different here is this one line here, this statistical smoothing function, which will essentially um, plot a line which contains the median or the smooth values um, in that blue line um, throughout there as well. All right, so there's a couple of fun things that we've done there. And what you'll see again is, as well as this kind of evolution of the style of R, right? So ggplot is a little bit older, so it's not using that pipe operator, it's using plus instead, right? But you would imagine that over time, um, but of course you can imagine the breaking change of that is, uh, the pluses may um, wind up in a library that will um, support this, this piping operator as well. Now, again, all of this stuff is plotting on a raw graphics device, right? So this thing is, um, essentially implemented um, by RTVS is there is this um, device that we have that accepts drawing primitives, right? So R is gonna send a bunch of commands to this canvas to say, here, draw a line, plot a point of this size and this position, those kinds of things. We generate a PNG, right? And then we send it back to Visual Studio and we render it um, inside of that window. So effectively, we're just kind of marshalling PNGs across the wire um, to do the rendering. Now, instead of doing that, what we could do is we can take the data and we can push it into the browser. So this is kind of cool. There's a library called Plotly, 
And when I run this next line, remember that P object, that P object contained that previous plot, the plot that's currently down here in the right-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner. We're gonna effectively just replay all of those commands um, for that thing in a different way to send the data instead. <laughs> what happened? Maybe I didn't have that. <laughs> of course, that, that, that's, that's a technical term there, that, that noise that you saw there. Um, let's run this next one, which is perhaps more interesting. I have no idea what happened there. Um, but the next command is kind of shows a, some of the kind of shinier things that you can have here. So there, what I'm doing is, you can see what the result of it is. If we go back to the code, it becomes a little bit more obvious. Um, I'm gonna take this hitters um, data frame. The x um, axis is gonna be at bats, y axis is gonna be hits again. Um, but the interesting thing is I'm gonna color it based on the batting average of the hitter, right? So it hits over at bats, and we'll see this interesting kind of gradient. You can probably pre you know, predict this, but you can kind of see it graphically in there as well, right? So we get a lot more interesting things when we can use more um, sophisticated um, uh, rendering platforms um, as well. So lots and lots and lots of examples of these things. This is an interactive plot. You can drag it, you can zoom it, and do other things with it instead of just viewing it. So let's continue going forward. Now, that takes me to this part. Now, some of you guys, the guys with gray hair like me, will remember the 1980s, right? And in the 1980s, there was these people, and these people went to their local Radio Shack store, right? And they bought a PC, and they bought a database program, right? Like DBase or Fox Pro, right? And later on, if they, they, they were in the early 90s, they would buy Access and Paradox for Windows. What those guys had in common was that they needed to do some computation, right? They were a doctor, or they were a lawyer, they were somebody, they, they had some job, or they were somebody working in a big company, they just needed to generate a report. And they went off, they, they used that technology to go off and do that, instead of relying on their central MIS department to go generate some report on some mini computer somewhere inside of their corporation. What I find is that data scientists are very similar to that same category of customer, right? Where they're gonna go off and do some computation, they write code in order to do that, much like that early Fox Pro programmer or, or Access programmer. And they typically weren't generating the program as their output, right? The program wasn't the thing that they shipped. They shipped a report. They shipped a PowerPoint presentation. They're trying to influence a decision. Things like that were the things that, that shipped as the output of these people. I find that, again, this is very similar to that as well. What you'll find that what people really want to do in R is they're munging their data, they're calling these functions, they're doing machine learning, they do a bunch of other stuff, but then they want to generate a report, right? Now, this is perhaps one of the coolest things um, inside of R, is um, this next package, which is called R Markdown. So if you've ever used Markdown before, and lots of people have used Markdown by now. Um, it's just a markup language which allows you to have um, very simple stuff so you can type and have formatting um, inline as well. Now, the cool thing about R Markdown is that you can also embed executable code inside of your Markdown documents. When you look at this thing, there's the preamble up there at the top, right? Um, but down here below, inside of these little blocks, like this one here, is R executable code. Now, since this is just, you know, a library, I, for example, I can just control enter and start executing this stuff or select a bunch of code here and execute that as well. Um, and if I wanted to dis display a table, this is that same DT thing, but with a fancier option turned on up above, right? So you can do things like, hey, I want to filter guys that got like between 18 and 47 home runs that year and things like that, right? So this kind of nice interactive table thing kind of comes out of this. But wait, the really interesting thing about this is that this thing, as I kind of scroll through it, has you know, these little columns. If you know Markdown, you'll recognize that's just a heading, right? a second level heading inside of there. And if you scroll even further through here, what you'll see is, huh, I can actually embed HTML in there as well, right? So I can have a mixture of HTML and some R code and some other stuff. I'm really building a report. So let's see what this looks like. Let's right click, go to preview, and preview HTML. This will go off and do some thinking. You'll see um, some, some processing happening. Effectively, what it's doing is it's rendering 
it's executing all of that R code that you saw inside of the different um, R blocks in there, sticking into a giant HTML document, and putting it out like this, right? So here is this document. This is kind of an interesting document because it's not just a static document. This is an interactive document, right? So the same sets of things that I could do before, right, are things that you can do inside of R, right? So if I want this interactive report, that, that just works, right? Because that's just all part of the way um, this library works. If I want to interactively search for guys like, um, right, I want to look up Chris Young there, I can do that as well. Now, what's kind of neat about this is there's this, but then you can have this kind of fancy layout, right? This is all using the bootstrap framework um, in HTML for laying things out in the columnar format, right? So this is an example of an adaptive um, UI. So you can see that um, on this, when the, the browser is wide, it can display three columns, right? But if I were just to go do this, we have this kind of adaptive UI stuff here. And you'll see that, again, all these plots down here below um, just show up in a single column in this case as well. It'll render nicely on a phone, right, all this kind of stuff, right? So very kind of cool thing to be able to just take a bunch of um, code that you've written, but now you can generate a report that, is, that contains executable code, right? So you're not in this business of typing stuff in a word and copy and pasting images and other things, you know, back and forth between the two things, right? So this is particularly cool. Now. So remember there was that analogy I was making to that guy from the 80s and the 90s with access. And access, I think, is a particularly good analogy here. Right, because in access, there was also VBA and a forms package, remember that? Right, you could build a Windows application, right, that you can ship right inside of the MDB file um, to a user, right? As long as the user had access installed on their machine, they can go off and run that as well, right? And you have buttons and drop-down boxes and all that kind of stuff. And so, all you needed to do, all you needed to know was um, VBA. And once you knew VBA and some SQL and some other stuff, right, you can go off and you can build an application. Same thing with R. So what R has is it has a package called Shiny. And what Shiny is, is it's a package that allows, remember we've already seen a lot of web stuff here, right? We've seen the tables, we've seen the plots and all that stuff. What Shiny does is it gives a scaffolding or a framework around all of that stuff so you can build an app. It turns out to be, not surprisingly, a web application. All right, so you can create one of these things, and it runs inside of the browser. And the, the, the R programmer doesn't need to know any JavaScript or HTML in order to go create that. All right, so all they do is they're typing their R code, and they can create um, um, an application that they can deploy to, to actual users. So it's very, very similar to this, this access idea. So again, let's run some code. It's a library called Shiny. I'm going to set the working directory to this predict um, directory that we have, and there's a few files um, inside of here. We'll talk about what they are in a second. But then I'm just going to run the app because it's much better to show you what the thing does. It's going to sit there and think for a little while. I may have to run it twice um, because of a bug. Um, but let me, let me run this again. And, and if the demo gods are... Gonna be good. We'll see a bunch of stuff show up. Oh, it's still not doing it. Okay, let me show you the debugger. <laughs> um, so let me go open up uh, this file here. And I still haven't figured out why. It's because I'm demoing in front of a few hundred people, right? That, that this thing is, 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 is acting up like this, right? But I can, I drop this thing in there. Let's, um, let's go to the R interactive window. Let's attach my debugger. Let's go back to the server code over here. And I'm gonna remember um, what I need to do now is I need to cause some code to run, right? So I'm gonna, again, just run this run app thing. It's gonna think, it's gonna drop me into this window here. And usually what happens is when I continue execution in there, oh, and of course it still doesn't do what it's supposed to. Okay, let me switch to an entirely different application which I do know works, but it's like a completely different, so I apologize up, up front for the rather severe context switch that you're gonna see right here. Um, but I wanted to show you one of these shiny applications. Now, of course, I wanna point out that this is also trying to make a point that I'm trying to make, which is, do you really want our programmers who don't understand HTML, JavaScript, web servers, producing production applications that users can use that they're probably gonna depend on because they're actually useful, right? 
Probably not, right? So, so you remember what happened? Remember history is a guide here, right? So, so in history, right, there's these guys that built all these apps once upon a time, and then all of you guys showed up, right? Right, the professional programmers, was, oh, let me, let, okay, just give me requirements now and I'll, I'll go type it all in C++, right? Which is what, what happened back in those days. And um, so that's what happened. I suspect a similar thing is gonna happen as well, right? These are great for prototyping, it's great for small teams to go off and get things done and built quickly but of course, at some point, there's always this, this, this additional role of the professional software developer to come in to build the software artifact right, that, that the organization cares about. So let me uh, uh, go back in here. Let's just start up uh, here. Let's just need to reset this guy. And let's go library shiny. And let's run app. And let's run it inside of, uh, oops. Ah, here's an excuse for me to show you IntelliSense. Um, so if I hit tab here, oops, oh, of course, you'll see that we also pop up this file IntelliSense thing. Because again, one of the things that happens a lot um, with, uh, with people working with files all the time, right, is that they have to open lots of files. So we have this convenient little shortcut there, um, which allows you to type things like this. So we have that, and let's run the app. And what this thing does is it uses the airport data, and what it does is it plots on the data. There's, there's a, uh, an airports database and a routes database, and it uses the routes database to compute the importance of the airport based on how many departures leave from the airport. And then we plot things onto a map that says, hey, you know, the bigger the dot, right, the more important that airport is. Right? So that, that's what this thing does. And so here's an example. There's almost no lines of code in this thing at all once you've figured out how to do the plotting. The interesting parts is how do I massage the data in the form that I want and all that. But now that I have this, I can have a filter like this. So if I wanted to, say, switch over to United Kingdom, for example, it just goes off and does that. Right? And when I click on individual airports, you can see the number of departures that leave from each one of those. And, of course, you can filter here as well. Right? So you can see, you know, and the map, of course, dynamically resizes, right? So this kind of an application is almost no lines of code. Let me show you the code on the server side. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of the, the stuff at the top here is really all the kind of preamble here that we have um, for reading the, the data in and massaging it. But this is the interesting server part. Right, so everything else above this was just a bunch of code that you would have had to type and you would have typed already um, to just be able to plot the data the way you wanted it to. Once you're down here, this is the actual thing here. So here, you can just read the, the, the code here. I'm going to go render um, some UI here, assign it to this output called controls. So I think the client side ID of the control is going to be called controls. It's an input selector or it's that drop down box. It's going to give me a list of countries. It's going to get the, the list of countries from the country's data frame that I have here, right? And the default selected one is United States, right? So, you know, the kind of code that you would expect to see here. Here's a slider, and the slider allows you to set the min and max values here. So, again, you can read the code there to see what that does. And then down here below is this render leaflet. Leaflet is another example of a library, um, one of these HTML widget libraries where you can take some data and you can plot it interactively on the map. It happens to get all that map data from OpenStreetMaps, right? Although you can get it from Google as well, right? Those are the two big kind of mapping API providers um, that are out there. And of course, down here, that, that plots it. So this is the, all of the server code that lives there. And then if you want to look at the UI code, the UI code is almost entirely declarative for this guy. Oops. Right, that's the entire, entirety of the client. All right, so it's just some layout. It's kind of written in this fluent style interface um, that we have here with lots of things in the parameter list um, um, as well. So if you've done any kind of fluent style layout, it's, it's very familiar to you um, from other things that you might have done um, in the past. <coughs> right, but that's Shiny. And so there's a lot of really kind of cool things. We're just getting started with this thing here. I can confidently assert that we typed zero lines of code inside of RTVS to support this. Because as you might imagine, right, this is just all a bunch of R libraries and function calls that are running inside of the R um, runtime. 
What we're going to do once we get the RTVS itself set up, there's a whole bunch of additional things we want to do post V1. So for example, imagine that you have the Shiny app, you wanted to deploy it, right? Because right now all it's doing is just running a local web server on my, on my laptop, right? So you can imagine that we can have a button there that says deploy to Azure, right? So we can click on the button, it's going to deploy it to an Azure website where it's pre-provisioned. And all we have to do in order to get that guy running is take all those R files inside of that directory Right, for the application, and copy them up to the server and run it, right? Because everything else will be pre-provisioned up there ahead of time. So lots of cool things that we can do um, there as well. You can imagine that, again, that SQL Server integration, you saw RODBC, I'm just typing in text, right? We, did, we typed zero lines of code to integrate SQL Server um, into RTVS as well in, so far in this release. But again, in the next release, you can imagine that, hey, what if I wanted to have a connection string to SQL Server? What if I wanted to use the rest of the tools and have SQL Management Studio or make um, uh, RTVS SQL syntax aware, syntax color, give me IntelliSense while I'm typing SQL inside of that. You can imagine those are all things that we can do um, inside of RTVS as well. Because again, we feel that there's this intersection of users that want to use R that also have lots of data sitting inside a relational database um, that we can make those two things work better together um, inside of the product. All right, so lots and lots of kind of ideas and things that, that we have in the pipeline um, in the near future. Let's come back to here. I'm pretty sure that's it. So let's go all the way to the last slide or whatever, or something. Aha, right? So here at the end of the talk, um, there's, there's a bunch of things. So this slide, which is um, available on the, the conference net, um, has a bunch of things. That first link is where you can go download the product. Um, we have our docs sitting there. So I showed you a bunch of those things as well. We're in a preview mode. We're going to be previewing. We're going to re release an updated preview release um, in about two weeks um, is when we're going to schedule our next release for. And roughly every month until we ship. We should be shipping um, sometime later on this summer with our, our first V1 release of um, RTVS. And then we're going to immediately turn and start building all of these integration things with all the other Microsoft technologies. Excel integration, we want to do that as well. So imagine we can do things like, remember that data frame, right? Wouldn't it be cool if you could take a data frame inside of RTVS, project it into Excel. So that if you edit the stuff in Excel, it changes it in the data frame, or if you change it inside a data frame, it changes in Excel. We can have that kind of two-way interaction um, back and forth between the two things. Or integration with Power BI, right? Um, to go off and use the Power BI visualization stuff. Or really, their server thing, which is what, what's really interesting about our, um, Power BI to generate um, dashboards as well. So we're going to be spending a bunch of um, cycles there um, to work on those integration pieces. But for the time being, what we're really trying to do is create a product that doesn't crash, right? That you guys can use every day, right? That's, that's goal number one. And I keep on telling people, especially managers, I say, hey, John, how about this shiny feature that, you know? So he's, no, no, we have to ship quality first, right? So that this thing is stable, works well, the debugger works all the time, things like that. Um, and then once we get that stuff in, then we have, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot and start working on all the, uh, the differentiator um, features as well. So I think that's about it, right? So thank you guys very much. I'll stick around afterwards. Um, 